Rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. morning. And welcome, visitors and church family. We're so happy that you're here. You know, God tells us in the Bible, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have loved you with an everlasting love. He is talking about you. You are beloved. Today we're really going to talk about how to reconcile with our neighbor. And... um, Anyway, we're really glad you're here today and believe that God has a good word for you. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we love you so much and we're grateful that you have made us at peace with God. We pray with you and we thank you that through your son, Jesus Christ, you have saved us from our sins and renewed us and restored us. Help us today to be more like Christ, forgiving, quick to grace. Thank you that you filled us with your joy. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I.
be seated. Preparation for the message, Acts 11, 15 through 18. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as He had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift He gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God saying, so then, even to the Gentiles, God has granted its repentance that leads to life. Amen. Christina Baker is an author and content creator. She started making faith-based videos for TikTok as a way to connect with people and encourage them in their spiritual journeys and prayer life. In her new book, Hope in 60 Seconds, Encountering the God of the Impossible, she includes prayers and stories of lives transformed to encourage readers to have faith in Jesus. Please welcome Christina Baker. Christina, hi. Thanks so much for being with us. So for those that don't know much about your story, let's begin with your faith journey. Yes, so Bobby, I was, I was born here in America, but I moved to Bolivia after my parents divorced. Mm. Kind of came from a broken home. There was no God in our home. Um, my dad was an atheist. My mom was a non-practicing Catholic. Mm. And so, by the time I turned 14, I was in the bars. I was, I got into self-harm and started getting into some heavy drug use. Got kicked out of my house by my stepdad when I was 15 and sent to live with my dad when I was, um, shortly after I turned 15. And my dad worked in the oil field. Uh, so the memories of my dad, I hadn't seen him in 10 years, were of him and, you know, suits. He was an executive. And I thought I was going to be arriving in this posh home in Hawaii. And when I arrived, he gave me the news that he was homeless. My dad was, uh, had been, you know, was kind of those, one of those things where he had a, an addiction to cocaine and also, you know, went into that descent of drugs. And so it landed him homeless living in a tent on the beach. So he gives me the news that I'm going to be living in a tent on the beach with him at 15. And so from there, I got off of the beach and was living home to home ended up uh, actually going to jail one night, many years later, uh, after I had been caught for drug possession. And while I was out on bail, a man, I was working at a university. So I was kind of living a double life like my dad. I was, you know, telling people how to live their life and then drugging at nighttime. Mm. And a man came up to me at my job, tapped me on the shoulder when I was contemplating suicide. And he said he had a word from the Lord for me. And I was like, a word from the Lord? I didn't believe in God. But that was my last resort. Like, how did this guy know that I was contemplating suicide at that very moment? So he invites me to this prayer meeting that they had on the third floor of the break room and um, says that the, the promised word of the Lord, he says that it's a matter of life or death. And I just knew at that moment, Bobby, that whatever this man was saying was truth. And he said, would you like to accept Jesus into your heart? And I was like, in my mind, I was like, Jesus, if you're real, come into my heart and fix my life. And all of a sudden, there's people gathered around me. They had their hands over me, praying for me. And it was like the boulders I had been carrying around 20 plus years of my life lifted. And so I gave my life to the Lord that day. I was still facing a court case. I was facing some jail time. And long story short, that case was dismissed at the very last moment. And the Lord just set me on a path to live for him and I was set on fire overnight. It was like I was dead in a coffin. And it was in one instant, I just came out of the coffin and I was alive. So in a snapshot, that is a bit of my faith journey. It's amazing. So just to be clear, you, you were using, but you were also, did you say you were working at the university? I was, yeah. I had figured out a way, which is what my dad, my dad did as well when he worked in the oil field. I was abusing drugs at nighttime and then yeah. getting it together during the day. And so I was doing both. 
It's interesting because I think that's more common now that you've, you're seeing that there are people who have like this double life. They're able to be like functionally uh, abusing drugs or alcohol, but you know, during the daytime they're functional. What do you think, I mean, what do you think it was when you're talking to someone like today, for example, that's maybe caught in that pit, what is it about Jesus or about that experience you had that worked where other things maybe didn't work? Yeah. You know, I explained this to my husband last night. All of my life, you know, if you've ever lost something, maybe you've lost your keys or you've lost your phone or you've lost your card in your house and you're looking for it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then you find it was like right in front of your face. Yeah. Well, that's what he was for me. I was looking for him in all of the wrong places, Bobby, in drugs, in alcohol, everything I could get my hands on. And when he revealed himself to me as my savior, it was like, the one that I had been looking for all of my life was always there. I call him the beach fall God because I, he was like a beach fall under the water that my atheism and I don't believe in God, all of my pain, my anger. It was like, I was trying to keep that beach fall under the water, but he'd come up at different ports like, no, stay down. And then the moment came where he was like, I've been here all your life. Yeah. And I've been looking at you. I've seen you all your, I saw you on the beach. I saw you in jail. I saw you, I also went through brain surgery. I went through brain surgery. I saw you in all those moments and I was always there. And so the hope I had been looking for in that moment, I found in him. It's awesome. That reminds me of like C.S. Oh yeah, it reminds me of C.S. Lewis's testimony where he was an atheist and he would say like, he was always mad at God for not existing, you know, like, and you can like feel, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Well, you've started posting videos on TikTok for people who don't know much about TikTok. It's like kind of like Instagram, but f funnier and more entertaining and more interesting. It's yes. like, <laughs> it's really a lot, a lot of it to me, I think seems like, uh, like a lot of comedy and a lot of dancing. How do you use TikTok to get your message out? And how, what is that like for you? And how did that happen? Yes, well, a couple of years ago, three days before the pandemic, the Lord gave me a dream and I'd never been a social media person. So it was a big leap of faith, but he showed me just the darkness of social media, especially what TikTok is known for. And I said, all right, Lord, we're gonna do this. So my husband set up a camera and you know, you, you've got to capture the young generation and, and quickly. Yeah. So it's a, and so I jumped in front of the camera. I said, hey, wait, let me pray for you. And I just asked the Lord for a word and I just began to pray. And to our surprise, the videos started going viral one after the other. And my husband and I looked at each other. We were like, wow, like there is such a need right now in this generation. People, you know, we know the harvest is ripe, but the harvest is desperate right now. Mm -hmm. People are desperate to know Jesus. And so even through a phone screen, through a computer screen, people are receiving his presence and prayer. It's been yep. an exciting journey. It's awesome. And, and uh, that's why you came up with this name for your new book, Hope in 60 Seconds, I assume, right? Because uh, TikTok has to be a 60 second video. It's funny they don't say one minute. It's like they really want to emphasize it's seconds, not a minute, you know? Uh, and a lot of people are enjoying your book. What do you hope people get when they read this book? Yes. Why, somebody asked me the question, what is it about your story that is giving people hope in less than 60 seconds? And it, when, it, when they asked me that, I thought, well, God doesn't need a lifetime to do something impossible in our lives. He needs yeah. one moment, not even 60 seconds. Yeah. And in a moment of surrender, he can heal, he can deliver, he can change what we think is impossible and make it possible. And so I've shared the, Bobby, the darkest moments of my life in hopes that people will be, well, that faith would be ignited in their hearts that if he did it for me, he will do it for them. He'll do it for their kids. He'll do it for their spouses. He'll do it for their loved ones and the people that they want to come back to the Lord. That's awesome. Christina Baker, thank you so much. Your book is Hope in 60 Seconds. Get a copy today. It's a, it'll touch your heart. Maybe if you need somebody who's going through a rough time, they'll be touched by the gospel. Thank you, Christina. We appreciate you so much. You, God bless you. Me. Our strength doesn't come from what we have or what we know. It comes from the fact that we know we cannot live without God. Tell me, what can I do? Cause I can't live without you. I can't live without you. Tell me, what can I do? Cause I can't live without you. I can't live without you oh tell me what can i do 
Cause I can't live without you, no I can't live without you Tell me what can I do Cause I can't live without you, no I can't live without you So here's my heart Here's my heart Here's my mind. Here's my mind. I give you my soul, Lord. I need you to take control because I've tried it, y'all. Because I've tried. I've tried it on my own, but tried it on my own. what I found is I can't make it. Thank you for joining us in worship today. As we emerge from a long season of being separated from each other, we now realize that the simple act of gathering with loved ones is something we cannot take for granted. It truly nourishes our souls and is such a pure and godly gift. Jesus loved to gather with people at big celebrations like weddings or smaller gatherings like lunch or dinner. It was at these gatherings that he would minister to folks from every background, from the elite to the sinners, and he would heal and redeem them. At Hour of Power, we care about your journey with Christ and your entry back into the abundance the Lord has to offer when we gather with loved ones. Psalm 36, 7 and 8 says, How priceless is your unfailing love, O God! People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. Our Savior welcomes each of us to taste His blessings and to drink of His delights. And this is what our power is all about. By helping us take the gospel message around the globe, you enable millions to feast on the wonders of the Lord's goodness from the comfort of their own homes. To help you plan your next gathering and to make your entertaining a little easier, we've created a unique offer just for you. 
Call, write, or go online today and request the Gather Here Complete Charcuterie Set. Included in this set is a bamboo cutting and display board, a four-piece cheese knife set, and our 40-page charcuterie recipes and tips book called Gather Here, Charcuterie for Family and Friends. We're asking for your gift of just $75 or more for all three items. Friends, your faithfulness to our ministry and your generosity is what makes Hour of Power possible and available to yearning hearts around the world. Thank you so much. And remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. Family, we serve a great God. And so today, we'll sing a song of celebration. Let's say. Say that. Let's celebrate our King. He's the ruler of everything. So let's lift His name on high. Come on, Zion, we praise our King. Ah, yes, let's take it up. He's our excellent king. He's worthy of all of our praise. And he's a righteous and glorious soul. Let's lift him up. Now let's do that first part one more time. Let's celebrate our king. He's the ruler of everything. So we will lift his name on high. Come on, Zion. We praise our king. Welcome to Shepherd's Grove. We're so glad you're here. You know, there are a lot of things you can do for your health, but one of the best things you can do for your health is to have meaningful friendships. And I think a lot of that's been lost in the modern world as we become more digital. We've lost, a lot of people have lost things like church and, or even having meaningful friendships at work, you know, going out for food afterwards. And we do so many things, don't we, for our health. We eat well or we 
spend hours at the gym, spend money doing these different things, and yet one of the best things you can do for your health is have meaningful friendships, especially in a setting like a church, where you have people who aren't just surface friends, but they pray for you and they're involved with your life. And that's what we hope to accomplish here at Shipman's Grove. You know, that during the week, you're able to build meaningful friendships with people that will help you grow in your walk with God and be there for you when times aren't as good. So I hope you find that here, or even more importantly, that you become that to somebody here. That's what we're going to talk about today. But before we do, would you stand with me? We're going to hold our hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord. Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with my neighbor. Thanks, you can be seated. I'm gonna read from the book of Acts right out of the gate. The story comes when Peter, who's the leader of the church in Jerusalem, uh, is invited by a centurion, Cornelius, who says, the Bible says, is a, man, a righteous man and seems to have some kind of connection with God and wants to be drawn into the faith, but doesn't know what to do. And so he wants to eat with Peter and Peter is reluctant to do it because he's a Gentile. And this is an irony we're going to see later, but Peter has this vision from God and God says, don't call unclean what I've called clean. So Peter eats with Cornelius and the gang, and they come to become the first sort of Gentile Christians. And it's this important moment in the Acts of the Apostles. And so when Peter returns and tells people that he's eaten with these Gentiles and that the Holy Spirit came upon them, at first they're very critical of Peter. How could you eat with sinners? Now, if you've gone to this church for a while, you know what that sounds like, doesn't it? It sounds like the Pharisees. This new, this body of believers, these Christians saying to Peter, how could you eat with sinners? How could you eat with Gentiles? Peter tells them his whole story and he finishes by saying in Acts 11, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us in the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the gift, he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, so then even the Gentiles God has granted repentance. That leads to life. This Gentile is very glad that Gentiles are allowed to come into the kingdom of God. This is Jesus' heart. We're going to talk about this today. The heart of Christ is reconciliation grace, forgiveness, and mercy. And particularly, Jesus likes to do it with food. Jesus had an eating ministry. You might not have heard me say this before because back in the day, I used to say this every Sunday. We used to serve communion. And before I would invite people to take communion, I would say, Jesus has an eating ministry and he's continuing it now in communion. He is the bread of life, but he also offers us the bread of life. Come now and eat with us. And that so much of Jesus' ministry was inviting sinners or people that weren't supposed to associate with righteous people to his table. And the Lord invites you to eat at his table today, to eat with him just as you are, not as you want to be or not as you should be. Jerusalem is a, an amazing place. It's an old, old city. There's old cities like Paris, and then there's old, old cities like Jerusalem that have been around a long, long, long time. There are a lot of wonderful things about Jerusalem. The food in particular is very good. We had the world's best falafel at least four times at four different places. But one thing you notice about Jerusalem in particular and the whole nation of Israel is although it's calm, it's calm like a bomb, as uh, one band said. It's, it's like a powder keg, even though it's not exploding. It feels like the smallest thing could cause the whole thing uh, to erupt. There's a saying in uh, Hebrew, shalom. Shalom, mashlam ha. This word shalom means peace. It means, and it's a greeting. It's, you say, it's like aloha. You say it for hello and goodbye. Shalom, shalom, shalom. 
Look at your neighbor and say shalom. I know it's 9.30, just get it off your chest. You guys, come on. Look to your neighbor and say shalom. You too, choir. Shalom means peace. And it's a deep word, it's more than just peace. It means like a, like a wholeness, like things are right. It doesn't just mean a lack of violence, it means real peace. And when we went to Jerusalem, we did not find, we found a surface shalom, but not a deep shalom, you know what I mean? When we first got there, uh, we had the real privilege of meeting Dr. Eli Sharon, who's uh, the guy that discovered the Temple Mount. Here he is, uh, oh, that's a paint. Uh, here he is on the, in the middle. This is uh, Eli here, world famous archeologist on the right, our tour guide. Ronnie, who's also a marine archeologist. And uh, behind us, you can see there, is the southern wall of the Temple Mount. That's where the original temple Jesus was. To the left of my left ear there would have been the gates where the money changers would have been. You can kind of see the steps behind those trees. And that's where people would have entered into the temple after using the mikvah. Well, this guy, Eli, is the guy who discovered the mikvah. It's a giant pool called the Pool of Siloam. You might remember it in the Bible in John chapter 9 when Jesus puts mud on the guy's eyes and he tells him, go wash in the pool. That's the mikvah, to prepare your, your eyes for, for the temple. And so he discovered it. But that temple mount is in many ways at the heart of the lack of peace because that is the holiest site for uh, all Jews. It's where the temple has to be. It can't be anywhere else. That's where the first and second temple both were. But now there's another holy site, the third holiest site to the Muslim community, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which has been there for like 1300 years, where they believe that Muhammad ascended into heaven and received the Quran. And so both of these religious communities have this deep religious significance and two very different narratives about that space. The, the western wall of the temple is the holiest Jewish site, but it's, it's only holy because the top of the mount is even holier. And so there's all this tension. There's tension around space, around history, around how things happen, around how people are treated, and deep entrenched tribalism. Also in Jerusalem, a lot of people ask me, what's your favorite thing? And mine is never what everybody else is. My favorite place, because I love history, is the Holy Sepulcher. A lot of Jews in particular and Muslims find this place very spooky and a lot of evangelicals find it spooky, but I love it. It reminds me like of a real life Hogwarts or, you know, dark castle. It does have a villainous kind of feel to it. It's, this is the biggest room where the actual tomb of Jesus, the tomb of Jesus there, according to tradition, and there might be some good reason why it might be the real tomb of Jesus. And then there's all of these caverns and there's six different denominational groups that all control this space. And so not only was the Temple Mount and still a place of great tension, but this church between these six denominations is also an entrenched place of deep animosity, resentment, rivalry. Um, when the first Holy Sepulcher was destroyed, by the caliphate after it came and took it from the Byzantine Empire. This was a big part of why the Crusades happened. And even after the church, this cathedral was taken back by the Christians, whoever those would be, whether it's the Orthodox, the Roman Catholics, the Armenians, the Coptics, there's six groups. And even when they controlled the place, our tour guide was telling us there'd be many mornings, you would arrive to the gates of the Holy Sepulcher Church and there'd be multiple bodies of priests lying around. And that was because sometimes the priests, just like the gangs of New York or something else, they would show up and fight over little spaces and kill each other, literally. They would, in their minds, lay their lives down for a, a, you know, some sliver of the church that they're going to have this pocket or that pocket. And it's just amazing to me. In fact, there's this ladder out front. This is the entrance of the, of the Holy Sepulchre. And this ladder has been in that one spot for 350 years because nobody could agree on where to move it and whose ladder it was. And so they didn't want to start a whole war 
over this ladder. And it's become, that it has its own Wikipedia page, this ladder does. It's called the Immovable Ladder. And it's a symbol of what came, came about about 100 years ago called the, the status quo, in which now all of the six denominations are at peace. And if they want to change anything in the Holy Sepulchre Church, they all six have to get together and agree, including where would we move that ladder? That's not peace, is that, is that peace? So even in the Holy Sepulchre, the holiest site for Christians, you also find an anti-spirit of Christ, right? Not a spirit of reconciliation and friendship and hospitality, but a spirit of, of outside uh, tolerance, but inside a bitterness, resentment, disagreement. And so, uh, and so what's the first thought we have at, at reflecting on this? Well, it's got to be religion's fault, right? That's why... That's why there's been so many wars. That's why there's so much fighting. Maybe your, most, your, your annoying friend has this bumper sticker, coexist, you know, and you're like, or you see this around town and it's a very clever, kind of out of style bumper sticker, but it, the, the message is clear, right? If religions could just get along, there would, there would be peace. And for sure, religions have, have gone to war, for sure. And Christianity has gone to war. But my argument is that if you think it's just religion, you got to look closer at history. Um, I would argue that the 20th century is so far the least religious century that we've had, except for the 21st, and yet was the most war-torn century in the world. Both the Nazis and the communists were anti-religious movements, right? The Nazis only abided Christians that went along with the Nazi propaganda and of course we're anti-Jewish. Communism didn't allow the practice of any religion and yet both of those groups drove so much of the wars of the 20th century and if religion went away I would guarantee that there would still be the same deep-seated resentments and wars but they'd be over different things that would still have very religious connotations. That's my argument. I don't have time for it, but it's not just religion is my point. It's religion too. There's also language. What if we all just spoke the same language? What if we all could just communicate with one, each other, with, with one another? Wouldn't that make a lot of strife and war go away? Uh, and in fact, there was a guy named L. L. Zamanoff who was a Jewish Polish ophthalmologist who created a language called Esperanto. And this was his dream. You know, he thought, what if we can create this, you know, language that combines all of these other languages and it becomes everyone's second language and we can all just sit at the table and talk. But this too wouldn't solve the problem. And it doesn't take very long. I love the heart behind this. I love the idea, but it doesn't really solve the problem. I mean, look at the, the feuds in Kentucky, for example, these thousands of young men and women who, who killed each other back in the day, and they were the same culture, language, everything, same race, and they all killed each other. Look at the, when I, in the 90s, when I was a kid, I, we weren't allowed to wear solid blue or solid red shirts where I went to school in LA because at that time, the, the fights between the Bloods and the Crips was so bad that uh, the teachers were afraid you'd get shot. They all spoke the same language and had a similar culture. Well, look at Democrats and Republicans. They almost speak the same language and they're always at each other's throats. So what is it? So maybe language isn't going to be the solution either. My theory, and I think you'll agree with me, is that there's something under all of these things that is the source of the problem, of all the tension, of, a, of the powder keg that many of us even feel in our culture today, and that is tribalism. Tribalism. That there is something about us that longs to belong to a group and a community. And those groups and communities hinge on narratives, a story. This is our story. And this is why, and this is so key, every tribe thinks they're the righteous ones. We're the righteous ones. We're the righteous ones. You will find that, yes, the Nazis believed they were doing good. Yes, the Ku Klux Klan believes they are the righteous ones. You will find that the most annoying person that you disagree with ideologically, whether it be in politics or religion, if you disagree with them, they think they are righteous and you are not. That's it. 
So there is a self-righteousness to every tribe that binds the tribe that has key taboos, things you're not allowed to say or foods you're not allowed to eat or people you're not allowed to associate with or, or clothing you're not supposed to or you are supposed to wear. There's a language, there's a... And all of these things deeply embed you in a sense that I belong to a tribe that's a part of a righteous group. One of my favorite books that highlights this idea that I, I think is supported scientifically. Jonathan Haidt wrote a book called The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Disagree on Politics and Religion. It's actually one of the 20 books that we sell in our bookstore. Uh, it's not a religious book at all, but I think it's so well written. And, uh, and uh, he makes the claim, and there's some studies that support this, that whenever we're posed with a moral problem, the question we unconsciously ask is not what's right and wrong, the question we ask is, what does my tribe say? What's my tribe say? If you deeply associate with a political party, you're going to say, what's my political party say? If you deeply associate with your family, what does my family say? If you de deeply associate with your church, what's my church say? And then you employ an inner attorney to defend the position. And this is a, a, a huge bias that if you want to create a good moral compass, it's a huge bias to overcome because our need to belong is, is uh, deeply embedded in that our group is the righteous ones. It was, uh, I'm looking for him, Craig Bourne, he's around here somewhere, I swear I just saw him. But anyway, uh, he pointed out this quote and I, when I reread the book recently, you're pointing out, I still don't see him. Oh, there you are. Nice to see you, sir. Uh, this great quote that we are not selfish, we're groupish. We're groupish. That's why people are willing to lay down their lives for their group. And so, this is the problem. The problem that we're facing here in the United States, the problem that is facing Jerusalem and Israel, isn't specifically religion, it's tribalism that's based on religion. Or it's not specifically culture, it's tribalism that's based in a culture. And this tribalism has an answer. You know what the, you know what the answer is? I know you're, you want to say Jesus, and that's right, but Jesus gives us a practical answer. The practical answer is food. It's food. Man, if you're hungry enough, you'll eat with your enemy. Nothing like food that brings people together. We found out a long time ago that small groups don't do very well if they don't have food. The best small groups are the ones with the best cooks. <laughs> it's true. Food. You see food and hospitality all throughout the Bible, and it's always at the heart of reconciliation. The Bible begins with food, remember? Food that you're supposed to eat and food that you're not supposed to eat. Remember the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life? Food is pleasing to the eye and delicious to the taste. Cool water, that's good for the bones. Abraham, when he's sitting at his tent, he sees God passing by with two angels or three angels or whatever it is, we don't know. And it's, they're, they're not coming to, to Abraham, they're passing by his tent. And Abraham runs after them and he invites them and he creates a feast for them. There's many examples, but of course the most obvious is just Jesus himself, who's constantly sitting and eating with people he's not supposed to associate with. This is the number one criticism that Pharisees have for Jesus. It's not even that he, his teachings on Sabbath and stuff like this, and those are some big ones. It's that he would associate and eat with prostitutes and tax collectors and Samaritans and people that are sin sinners and outsiders. To sit and eat with someone was to call them a brother or sister, to call them an equal. You're not supposed to do that back in those days, but Jesus is doing it constantly and changing people's lives with food. And of course, we as Christians believe that Jesus is food. He's living bread and living water, right? And so that's why we celebrate the Eucharist or communion. And so Jesus invites you to the table. Um, maybe you can have an eating ministry the way Jesus did. M maybe you can invite people you're afraid of that we are supposed to love to have some good food, especially if you're a good cook. God doesn't make good cooks for no reason, you know. He makes them for reconciliation. That's why you're so good at cooking. Okay. Are you good if you're bad at cooking? Maybe 
you got to ask your, you know, somebody else. Jesus had an eating ministry. One of my favorite stories is a story about a guy named Daryl Davis, who's a committed Christian, black man, uh, hugely successful musician. He played with uh, a number of the big, like, boogie-woogie guys. But he tells a story that back in the 60s, when he was 10 years old in Massachusetts, he was the only uh, black kid in his Boy Scout group. He was 10 years old, and he'd never dealt or experienced racism that he had known of. And he was doing this march through town, through this town he grew up in, and he was the one carrying the American flag. And he said all of a sudden he started to feel things being thrown at him, like a, a, you know, beer cans or food scraps. And his first thought is that he just thought these people didn't like the Boy Scouts. And he's wondering, why are they throwing stuff at us? And what happened is the scout leader started to surround him and walk with him to sort of protect him from the things that people were throwing at him. This was in the north, by the way, in Massachusetts. And when he got back, he asked his teachers, why were they throwing stuff at us? And they said, oh, they just avoid the question. And then he went to his parents and they sat him down. And it was the first time he was taught by his mom and dad about racism. That the, the only reason was because of the color of his skin. And to him, this just didn't make sense. He didn't like this answer. He, he thought, how could somebody not like me just because of the color of my skin? And so in life, he would constantly try to reach out to pay people that he experienced, you know, as, as racist. Until, <laughs> this is an amazing story. I can't believe this story. You can see the story on YouTube. Until he finally, one day, uh, invited the imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan over for dinner. <laughs> now this started, this started, the imperial wizard, I guess, I think is the national leader. So it's like the president of the whole thing, right? Somebody that every, I'm sure everybody in this building thinks is utterly evil. But imagine not just being evil, but being black, how scary that would feel. He invited, the, the first touch point was inviting this man for an interview to hear about the Klan. And he told his secretary, don't tell him I'm black. And so first he invited it. This is him with the, with the Klan leader. Can you imagine how scared he is? I mean, he, he looks tough there, but inside he's got to be feeling a little scared, you know? And he has an interview with this guy, and then he starts inviting the guy over for dinner. There it is, it's food. And at first, this guy, Roger Kelly, brings his bodyguard, who is always armed, and he keeps inviting him over to his house for a good meal. And over years, they become great friends, and they have this discussion about, he tells one story where this guy says, well, don't you know that there's a gene in black people that makes them more violent? And Daryl says to him, well, don't you know there's a gene, it's scientifically proven, that makes white people serial killers? And he says, well, what do you mean? And he says to him, tell me one serial killer that's black. And, I'll, and they couldn't think of any. And he goes, well, I could tell you 10 serial killers that are white. And he says, well, that's just stupid. And he goes, exactly. You know. <laughs> it's these kinds of conversations that over time, because you know, of his character, he's able to endure, obviously, scary guy full of hate and racism. But eventually this guy, Roger Kelly, repents and gives up his uh, costume, whatever that thing is. And over time, Daryl Davis has actually convinced 200 different people to leave the Klan. And whenever they leave, they give, they give, uh, they give him his... Uh, his outfit. So, so what do we think about this? What do we think about this, right? There's some people that might actually be critical of Daryl Davis. How could you associate with sinners like that? How could you associate with someone that is so obviously evil, racist, everything that's not American, everything that's bad, right? Like how could you, as a black man, betray your you know what I mean? Like, how could you do that? But then there's another aspect that's like, well, Daryl Davis, first of all, is a committed Christian. And maybe he's doing exactly what Jesus taught us to do in the most effective way. He's doing it in a way that as a white guy, I can't do, right? I can, you know, there's something really special about that story. And I, I love that story because I think it's the food part. That the main way he does it is food. Daryl Davis has an eating ministry. I have an eating ministry. Are you a good cook, by the way? You know what my stuff is? I make a million dollar mac and cheese. That's what they call it. It's actually about 50 or 60 bucks, but it's million dollar mac and cheese sounds better. 
because you have to go to Whole Foods and you have to buy all the really good cheeses. See, that's what people miss out on the mac and cheese is they buy the cheap cheese so it, you get what you pay for, but you gotta use the expensive cheese. And you gotta grate the cheese. You can't just buy it grated, you have to grate. We gotta make America great again. <laughs> that's what we gotta do. We gotta grate. That's where we're. <laughs> that's the joke. And that's the cooking. The cooking is, there's something about preparing hospitality, inviting people to your table that breaks down so many of these walls that we put up. Don't you want real peace in America again? Not, not a, not a surface peace, but a deep peace where you like your neighbor and your neighbor likes you. Well, that's what Jesus calls us to do. He doesn't call us to just tolerate each other. He calls us to be hospitable, forgiving, and loving to each other. And I'm so glad that there were people when I was a jerk, when I had things in my life, that were still willing to invite me to their table to eat some good food on a hard day. Jesus had an eating ministry, and this is where Peter is. You know, Peter was invited to Jesus' table, and in Acts 11, Peter discovers that one of the best things Jesus does is loves people right where they're at. That Christianity and the gospel is, turns everything upside down. Everything else says, behave, and then you can belong to us. But Jesus says you belong before you behave. You belong before you get it all right, and you even belong before you believe. Won't you come at the table and sit with me? And they did, and they rejoiced, and the Lord rescued them from their sin. I think at the, at the heart of this, of what I'm really saying, is a type of possibility thinking, actually. To look at someone that you find as scary or evil or an outsider as a Christian and decide to wonder is it possible that they could change? It's the spirit of seeing what is possible in someone. The spirit of seeing a person and wondering, yeah, maybe they're mean-spirited now, but could they become a kind person? Yeah, they're standoffish now, but would they let me in? And the spirit of Jesus is the spirit of saying, this person may be an outsider to me now, but it's possible that they could come to know the Lord. Maybe I can make for them some million dollar mac and cheese, or I also make a very good chocolate chip toffee cookie. That's for another time. And I make a very good smoked honey chicken. Any of these things, I don't know what your best dish is. Maybe you make a mean bowl of cereal, but <laughs> it works. Invite people to your table and begin to listen to people and watch how that will bring peace to your heart too. You'll find that not everybody's as bad as you think they are. So Lord, we just love you. And I ask that you would give us a true spirit of shalom, not to judge or to blame, but to understand that everyone has a different story. Everyone has different parents that taught them different things. Everyone grew up in different places, but you love us all, Lord. Help us to understand that even evil people are your beloved sons and daughters, and you want them as a prodigal son to come home. Help us to not be like the elder brother, but to be like the father that waits at the door wanting to see your children home with you. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. to our channel yet? If not, then I hope you will. Our power is filled with uplifting content to nourish your spirit and help you grow closer to Jesus. We've created this channel to remind you that no matter who you are or what you've done, God loves you and so do we.